Hello, and welcome to the Hilaritas Podcast, brought to you by Hilaritas Press. I am your host, Mike Gathers. Join us as we explore the world of iconic writer Robert Anton Wilson, those who influenced him and those who have been influenced by him. Visit us at hilaritaspress.com slash podcast for show notes, links, and past episodes. In our last episode, we spoke with Antero Ali on Chapel Perilous, Paratheater Technology, and the Eighth Circuit Model of Consciousness. And with this episode, we chat with author and Reason Magazine editor Jesse Walker on Chapel Perilous. Like the previous episode, the original idea behind this interview is to produce a multi-guest mega-episode on Chapel Perilous as part of our Cosmic Trigger series. But in the end, it made more sense to release these interviews as their own separate episodes. And so with that said, I'm excited to introduce our guest for today's episode, writer Jesse Walker. Jesse Walker, welcome to the Laritas podcast. I'm glad to be here. Nice to, I've known you online for years. Nice to actually have a face and name to go with. Ah, yeah, great. Me as well. So great to have you on. So we're doing um, an episode here on uh, Chapel Perilous, and we just covered Carrie Thornley. But I was wondering, uh, maybe you had a high-level summary of Carrie Thornley's experience of Chapel Perilous you can give us. Well, I think it's interesting to contrast what happened to Carrie Thornley with what happened to Paul Krasner, because okay. they're, both, they're both friends of Bob Wilson's, both interested in um, conspiracy theories and a lot of other things initially in a kind of ironic, let's just play with these ideas way. And then in a holy crap, my inventions are coming to life around me way and plunged into um, a state of uh, paranoia, which Paul Krasner wrote about in his memoir, um, Confessions okay. of a Raving Unconfined Nut, which is a very fun book, which I recommend as an aside. And in Krasner's case, he came through it. He had this sort of moment of levity when he realized that while there are real conspiracies out there, they were not all on his trail. Um, and he, he tells this uh, story in the book of being on a bus and thinking that someone was watching him and reacting by taking out his pen and, and clicking it and saying into it, paging Abby Hoffman. And then he told Abby Hoffman later, and Hoffman said, oh, I, I got the message, but I didn't pick up because you were calling collect. But he sort of realized after this and, and, and some other things that happened, there was um, a group of cops gathered around the uh, building where he lived. He thought they were after them. Turned out there was a rapist in the neighborhood. There were just some things that sort of drove home for him that he had gotten kind of addicted to this idea of conspiracy, and he had to sort of pull through it. Um, mm. And he continued to write about conspiracy theories, to publish stuff about them as an editor, and above all, to make jokes about them in his stand-up act. But he uh, came through the other side of, you know, to use the metaphor of this episode of Chapel of Perilous. And Kerry Thornley didn't. I mean, he had his moments of lucidity after he plunged into, you know, being convinced that he was, without knowing it, a part of the JFK assassination and, and all these other things that were supposedly going on, you know, real society breeding programs and, and, and all of that. But he really kind of ended up stuck there. And there's this line, I, I should have got it in front of me before you started interviewing me, but I'm sure you can find it if someone hasn't already quoted it, you know, where Wilson says, if you get stuck in Chapel Perilous, you're going to come out either a complete paranoid or a complete agnostic. And I think, you know, Thornley went paranoid and Krasner went through his mm. long paranoid night of the soul and then came out the other end at agnostic and was able to, again, engage with this stuff humorously, but with maybe greater wisdom than he was bringing to it when he first started doing his conspiracy satires. Ah, so there's a perfect juxtaposition there right out of Wilson's quote, the paranoid and the agnostic. I, I was not aware of, of Krasner's journey. And actually what came up for me is sort of a side note is uh, the comic Mark Marin, I believe, mm -hmm. had like a similar experience uh, that he writes about in his autobiography where he just got really fell into the government conspiracy thing. And I think a friend of his, a friend of his that worked in the government said, you know, we're just not that, that organized. Mm -hmm. 
And that was like the the quote that shattered his illusions and, and brought him back to earth. But how would you define Chapel Perilous for us? Well, it's, um, it is that kind of long, dark night of the soul or that long, paranoid night of the soul where you at least are willing to engage these ideas because stuff is happening around you that you feel the need to explain. And I know it's, it's interesting, Wilson never defines it precisely. And people who pick up on it from him, like Antro Alley and others, they don't always define it precisely because, and it's not because it's undefinable, it's because I think that expression, Chapel Perilous, which of course originally came from the Arthurian mythos and so on, is itself so evocative in ways that a lot of these exact definitions can't be. I sometimes wonder if Wilson wrote about it in the context of individuals, but he also, I I dug up this bit in uh, Prometheus Rising where he is quoting uh, Dr. Ilya Prigozhny, and I might be and probably am mispronouncing his name, although I actually, he did come up in one of my college classes, so maybe there's a muscle memory somewhere in my, uh, in my, um, in my tongue there. Prigogine, um, I believe. Is, is it Prigogine? That, okay. I, yeah. That's how uh, I know it, but I couldn't tell you. But it's yeah, dissipative it, structures is maybe his thing. Is that exactly? He has this line that Wilson uh, quotes: "All dissipative structures are teetering perpetually between self-destruction and reorganization on a higher level of information or of coherence." Mm. And In a way, that's what's going on with the individual's journey through Chapel Perilous. But you can also then think of things we go through as a society or individual communities and families as being analogous to this. I I, I often have felt in the last few years as though, you know, the United States and maybe larger chunks of the world are going through a kind of Chapel Perilous type journey and wondering if that will ultimately... um, resolve itself on the higher level of coherence or not. But certainly a lot of what gets construed as, you know, everybody getting more paranoid. I, I'm, I'm not someone who believes there are more, you know, people are more prone to conspiracy theories now than in the past. But I do think there are moments of where things kind of intensify. And what we've been going through the last few years reminds me a lot of what happened to the United States in the 1960s and 70s, which of course mm. is also the time that Wilson had his experience with Sirius, Thornley had his experience, Krasner had his experience, Philip K. Dick had his experience. All these sorts of people that we, you know, come up in these contexts went through it then at the same time that, you know, the sort of interval from, uh, you know, Oswald to Hinckley where everything seemed to be going crazy. And you have, you know, this sort of groups sprouting everywhere that people called cults, some of which are very cultish, some of which are just radical new experiments and how to live and how to think and outsiders think they look you know cultish um you have this sort of paranoia then that sways around them and then and i say i mean one problem with using the word cults is people just think of religions but also tiny political sects terrorist groups groups that look like they might turn into a terrorist group at any moment self-help groups and so on they just pop up like mushrooms at certain periods. Um, they're, it's mm. been happening now. It happened then. It happened in the Jacksonian era, which was another one of those intense, you know, Annabelle, I mean, culminated, I mean, the, after Jackson, but the sort of Annabelle and reform period culminates with the Civil War. You know, these uh, times when the country goes through these uh, sort of chapel perilous. And I don't want to take this metaphor too far because it's the nature of society that lots of things are going on simultaneously. Nothing ever coheres on a total level for everybody. But at least to an extent, I think it's a useful metaphor. Um, and it certainly uh, helps me try to make sense of stuff that's happening around me. I'm with you 100% though on something's going on. There seems like a national, global... Well, to me, if Chapel Perilous is is sort of this place where the old ways are starting to crumble and no longer have meaning and the new ways have yet to take shape and we're in this place in between and it's just lacking structure and it's scary, especially if you need structure to, to hold on to, then it certainly seems like we're in some sort of of Chapel Perilous of political nature and a national level. It almost seems to me like there, you know, sometimes we talk about how the the far right and the far left kind of swing so wide and start to come back on themselves. And I don't know if you have a pulse on that or a feel for how it it seems to me like that's stronger than ever, but I don't, I don't know. Although the middle has gotten kind of weird too. (laughs) 
<laughs> there's a, there's a, a lot of stuff you read in the mainstream press where it's hard to imagine someone um, saying that 20 years ago necessarily in that kind of a venue. You know, there's that line from Chesterton. Actually, Chesterton didn't say it, but people always attribute it to him. Um, the first effect of not believing in God is to believe in anything. And of course, Chesterton is a devout Christian, and he was sort of making a point about how, I mean, because this is like a garbled, sort of snappier version of some things he really did say, that, you know, people uh, who give up on the old orthodoxies can um, sort of just become gullible and, not, and, and maybe deserve a bit of skepticism aimed at them. But at least that's what a lot of people quote it mean. But I kind of like to turn it on its head and think, well, as someone who likes heterodoxy and people giving up on the old orthodoxies and um, trying to think for themselves and, and and not just the old orthodoxies, but the old hierarchies, the, the big institution and hierarchical institutions that those orthodoxies have propped up. I think that when trust in the old authorities decay, decays, you know, people, some people are going to look for substitute certainties when that old certainty goes away. It's a, the renewal process that allows the less rigid and less hierarchical alternatives to emerge, you know, the kind of anarchistic stuff that Wilson fans are going to be into. It, there's going to be this byproduct of people reaching out for, um, you know, things that look kind of cultish. And you're going to have people on both sides of that divide looking at one another and getting paranoid, saying, what the hell is going on over there? Yeah, it certainly seems to be happening in politics right now. As, as far as the horseshoe metaphor, though, my problem with the horseshoe metaphor is that it's too linear. It's still a bent line. I feel like it, we need like a hyperlink <laughs> metaphor where everything is adjacent to everything else. You know, mm. once you've encountered a libertarian Maoist, there have only been about three that I know of people <laughs> who tried to combine um, libertarianism with Maoism. But once you've encountered that, you realize you can mix anything. Um, so I... There's this great concept of the cultic milieu, and this is a different use of the word cult, but the idea that there's this sort of um, underground in society where all these ideas that are outside the mainstream float around, although sometimes they get broadcast into the mainstream. And the guy who thought up the idea was talking about, you know, stuff like ESP and, and astrology and so on. But other folks have done like sort of a political version of that too. You know, there's a political underground, which overlaps with that kind of new age over underground, but it's got, you know, all, all kinds of Marxist reactionaries, libertarians, anarchists, futurists, and so on. And it's, in my view, it has some of the most fruitful and um, creative political thinking around and also some of the purest lunacy you will ever find. <laughs> but people who get into it, People who enter the cultic milieu, which may or may not overlap with entering Chapel Perilous, they find it really easy to sort of shift from one of these ideas to another in ways that if you're used to the linear political spectrum, looks weird. Like, weren't you an anarcho-capitalist and now you're a tanky? What happened there? But within the logic of how these uh, different ideas and the people who express them interact, especially now, I mean, like just in, have interacted in subcultures for ages, but especially now that it's easier than ever before to find each other online, it makes perfect sense. At least it makes sense to me. And again, that's part of that whole sort of everything popping up like mushrooms. I'm, I'm mixing metaphors. <laughs> popping up like mushrooms as we head through Chapel Perilous. <laughs> You mentioned, boy, you mentioned a variety of things, but there's something about that comes up for me when you mentioned the middle getting weird, but it's it's like harder and harder to be in the middle these days. Like mm -hmm. it's this kind of multi, I don't know, it feels like you have to pick a side. That mm -hmm. it really, and that, that requires you subscribe to a dogma and kind of stop thinking and just adhere to that side, which makes me want to spin out even further into Chapel Paris. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's a weird time when I find myself feeling like a centrist sometimes, <laughs> um, because I always, I mean, this used to be, especially when I was in my 20s and first writing about politics, I would say, look out to the far left and sometimes, the, you know, the far right, and you know, this is where you find people who are challenging the war machine that all these people in the center accept, you know, it's uh, the real danger is the people with the power in the middle. And that's one way of thinking of the middle. But to me, it's more and more as people are being told you have to go into one of two camps. And of course, we all know there's more than two alternatives, and uh, these aren't tend not to be led by the best representatives of those two alternatives <laughs> to begin with. It's not like the smartest conservatives are running the Republican Party, and you know the most compassionate liberals are in charge of the Democrats. But it's uh, but even you know setting setting that aside, 
if you don't sign on totally, especially if you have lots of friends with different perspectives who believe in different things, I, I find myself sort of playing middleman and explaining someone one person's views to another view person or trying to because they can't interact with each other. And and I'm like, I don't see myself as as a moderate temperamentally, you know, in terms of what I think has to you know happen in this country and this world and so on. But there is something for being a, a mediator, you know, being in the middle that way and, and trying to um get across to someone who just doesn't understand why someone wasn't enthusiastically voting for their candidate last year, why that might have been the case, um, why they voted for the other guy or just didn't vote at all. Well, I'd love to hear some tips on how to mediate, because for me, it feels like if I try to interject some, well, I want to call it reason, but a discussion around one of these, these political elements the assumption is that if I'm not 100% on your side, then I must be on the other side. And I'm, to try to insert more nuance in there, sometimes, I don't know, I don't have the patience for it, maybe, and I just walk away. But A lot easier with your friends than with anonymous, truly people on the internet, you know. So Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, the, the, uh, I, I remember I had an experience a few years ago. There was something where I actually, I was defending Trump on a certain point. It was when he was trying half-assedly to do the peace talks in Korea and all these people were like freaking out. And I, and I say, look, last year he was like on the verge of starting a nuclear war. This is so much better. I, he's probably going to belly flop, but, you know, don't go after him for trying to do these, these talk. And I, and I wrote something short to this effect. And um, this person was in the comment thread accusing me of having Trump derangement syndrome, even though I was defending Trump in this case, because my analysis of what was going on was not completely on board with what, you know, the loyal Trumpkins were supposed to be saying. And I say, like, you are really far gone if you don't recognize that I'm actually agreeing with you this time. But, you know, that's, I mean, that was sort of an extreme case, but it's like, some people really does have to be 100% or nothing. And they can't just take a win, can't say on this one, you're on my side. But I don't think most people are like that. I think that's, that's like 15, 20% of the country are the really hardcore partisans who consume this stuff as like a, as like a, either because they're doing it professionally or because there's sorts of people who consume um, cable news as a, um, as their primary hobby. Most, even most sort of political people who I interact with day to day do not act like that. And maybe that's just the story then that I have in my head that you just have to take a side or, or you uh, are going to face the punishment. But it's but, the, but there are people who are like that, you know, and they're very, very loud. That, that was actually going to be my, my next point was that it, you've made me kind of think about this differently. And, and I have been thinking in terms of just a vocal minority that can really dominate the landscape to the point where it for me, it's crazy making. I mean, I think that's why it's relevant to this conversation is there is this kind of crazy making that goes into like, you have to be way over here or way over here and there's no, there's no middle ground and there's no, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a, a path right through the middle of the chapel that I'm going to try to combine these metaphors in some ways that work. Perfect. And, and you can stick to that chapel and get to the end. Or maybe you'll just find yourself in another part of Chapel Perilous because that's the kind of structure it is. So when you say that, do you have some uh, thoughts for us on how to navigate Chapel Perilous or how, as a, if, if we're in a national or global situation here, how do we find oh, our way out? I'm not a self-help writer. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, you know, try to keep your own... Um, when a story first pops up in social media, don't believe it till it's been confirmed. And then don't believe the confirmation till you know they're not just talking to the same person the first person was talking to. And, and always realize that, you know, whenever like a big, like really horrible thing happens, you know, a terrorist attack, a, um, a mass shooting that may or may not be a terrorist attack, you know, or, you know, uh, somebody ran, ramming an SUV through a crowd, People will often leap to this is a special sort of confirmation bias that says, like, who do I, who am I most scared of, who I can then blame for this? And sometimes 
you will be right because often you'll be scared of someone who can do some, you know, scary things. But usually, I mean, a lot of the times, and I think probably most of the time, the truth will turn out to be far weirder than whatever either you or the people you're arguing with assumed was going on because the world is weirder. It's filled with all these different folks with unique personalities and problems and circumstances. And it does not conform easily to the narratives that we um, want to uh, impose on, on the world and that there are whole cable news channels devoting to helping us impose on the world. And just just be aware that something, um, it, and when I say weird, it's not necessarily going to be kind of the high weirdness that we talk about with Temple of Perilous. I just mean something unique and distinctive that reflects the fact that there's a lot of texture in this country and there's a lot of texture in the human personality. And especially when you're talking about why is someone going to walk into a bar and um, shoot a bunch of people or something like that, you, there are all sorts of things that could break a person that way and prompt them to think that that's somehow something that's, that, you know, to do, um, that, you know, so I, uh, I, I, I guess, I don't know if this is advice. I it sort of <laughs> stopped being advice if it ever was, but, you know, try to keep your head, try to be the agnostic, even, even when you're being paranoid, try to keep a few, um, alternative paranoid ideas in mind. So you won't get totally locked onto one paranoid path without realizing all the fearful alternatives that you could be exploring. Perfect. Would you say that was, if we go back to the Krasner example of somebody who made it through becoming kind of multi-model agnostic is, is a real key here? Yeah. I mean, Paul Krasner had the advantage of being like a, a brilliant humorist. I mean, he was like really adept at seeing the absurd side of life and that helped him see the absurd side of his own life at what he was, had become mm. and what he was doing to himself. I, I, I think, I suspect that's part of what was happening with him, but I don't think you have to be, uh, I mean, Terry Thornley was a pretty funny guy too. He kind right. of into Discordianism. That's a funny religion, yeah, that's, you yeah. know? <laughs> and, and yet he, um, I mean, of course, who knows what else was going on in Kerry Thornley's mind. I, I don't, um, I suspect that there was a lot, uh, I'm not going to psychoanalyze a guy from afar, but I just imagine that, you know, going deep into his life, there were um, issues that helped shape how he responded to Chapel Perilous when, when he found himself stuck in it. Yeah, there seemed to be a number of influences on Thornley that one could easily, I could easily see where where the paranoia just took root and was hard to get break through there. But there's something about levity and humor and maybe not taking yourself and, and, and things so seriously that allowed somebody like Krasner to, to move through it. But what you said earlier, too, is, is I think very relevant. You mentioned just what are you most scared of? Uh, there's something about fear in the chapel when you when when structures dissolve and you're in unfamiliar territory it's, it evokes some of our deepest fears i think and and then we look for some simple answers and like you said the truth is actually probably far weirder or maybe far more complex and we really just need something simple to hold on to to give us comfort i think you're right yeah yeah so if i were to expand outward again as, as an observer of political happenings have any thoughts on where the world is going right now with with all this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um, I guess I, I'm I'm not a prophet. I'm not gonna make yeah. any. Um, Fair enough. There, there, there are there are so many. I mean, we haven't even mentioned COVID, but of course that's a huge part of what's happened for the last two years. And I think we're coming out of that, you know. But we're coming out pretty gradually. You know, and, and we don't know how much of what changed during um, COVID is permanent and how much it isn't. And, and when you look at some things like structures that really did not perform well, like a lot of schools, a lot of schools did not perform well. And you then say, well, what's going to happen? Are they going to, because now a lot of, a lot of families are dissatisfied with those schools. A whole lot of people have left the schools. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's an unusually high dropout rate or departure rate. I shouldn't say dropout because I think most of them ended up either in other schools or homeschooling or whatever. But actually with a lot of very low income people probably did just drop out. What's going to happen there? How many people are just going to disappear? How many people are going to come back and make the schools better? Um, how many are going to come back and put up with what they're like? And how many are going to build 
do their best to build better alternatives. I hope a whole lot of better alternatives are going to be fueled by this. That could be, you know, the the um, reformulation at the higher level or whatever the uh, precautionary precaution, whoever you decided what to call them. Quote, uh, but you know, you can imagine other ways it'll um, it'll suss out as well. But the pandemic kind of showed us how much we could just be, I mean, the country was already going through one chapel perilous and then suddenly there's another one inside mm. it, like a little TARDIS that we get kind of enter and now what are we lost then? And then it had the effects of, I mean, how much of the protests and riots last year, how closely was that related to the fact that people had been cooped up and now it was something they could go outside and do and they didn't have work the next day? It's, uh, I mean, there was a, obviously a sincere movement. I supported the movement, but I also had to wonder um, if this had happened any other summer, you know, would it have, would it have gone this way? You, you can't predict all the secondary and tertiary effects of uh, something, especially something as big as a global pandemic, but, you know, smaller stuff as well. So all I can say, my prediction is keep expecting weird, unexpected things to happen. Keep expecting some systems to break down, but you don't know which ones. And always be uncertain about whether they're breaking down or not. You know, over the last few elections, every time power changes hands, there's this big uh, wave of stories about how whichever party just lost, sometimes it's the Democrats, sometimes the Republicans, well, they're on the ropes now. They might not have a majority again for ages. And then two or four years go by, and of course, it flips. And the, it's the other party that's getting, you know, practically the same stories written about it, just, you know, fill in a different set of things they need to fix, which always seem to have reflect what the person writing the prescription would be, you know, asking them to do anyway. And it's like, maybe at some point, one of those parties really will break down and go the way of the Whigs. Maybe at some point, there'll be a uh, uh, one party will actually have more than just 51% of the federal government at any one time, you know, that can sustain and it can sustain that for more than a couple of years. Or maybe it's just this, uh, there's just a constant system, a constant churn that looks like a breakdown. I mean, in a way it is kind of a constant permanent breakdown, but it, it's, it, it's not, it's not decay so much as it's churn. Um, and maybe we'll be locked into this stalemate for years and years to come. I don't know. I just know better than to trust that first wave of stories after every election day. Mm. I appreciate you tackling these questions. Do you have a sense of what's behind all this change? You mentioned COVID. COVID to me feels like a catalyst, but maybe not. Yeah, I mean, it cat I think that um, it's been like this for a long time. I mentioned the Jacksonian era. You can read stuff from the 1820s and 1830s where people talk about the sort of breakdown of families and communities being wrought by industrialization and all these new religions forming and reform movements and so forth. And it really feel, sounds a lot like stuff today. Um, and I mean, obviously some huge differences, but I mean, you can see patterns there. Um, it doesn't mean that the... Um, and, that, you know, and also the effect of new technologies in that case would be something like the telegraph. It doesn't mean that it's not more intense now because everything is so much faster now. I mean, it, I mean, because of the technological growth and the amount of global trade and the ways that the world is uh, interconnected and we're all in each other's living rooms, at least if we want to be, you know, in, in ways that were inconceivable, even, you know, when I was you know born 50 years ago, let alone, you know, before the Civil War, but it feels like it's almost like the same process was going on and it's just gotten faster and faster and mm. faster as the velocity and complexity of the system grows more rapid. And even when it's um, interrupted suddenly by something like one of the world wars, you know, enormous disasters that nothing has happened to us recently, like even Paris Jill, it's a still a, um, it manages to reassert itself. So. I guess my prediction is if, if, if we don't actually destroy all of civilization, and I'm not betting that we will, then th we can expect, you know, this sort of the velocity and complexity to increase. And that's really kind of, I think, what's, I mean, if, if there's one thing that's behind this, I mean, Wilson called it, you know, it, it's related to what he called the jumping Jesus phenomenon. And, you know, there are a lot of Jesus out there jumping. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's not what he meant by it, I know, but it seemed to seem to fit. Well, well, no, I think you're onto something that it, there's this exponential growth curve of information 
Yeah. And, but there's also just the exponential growth curve of technology. And I think there's more than one technology and there's, there's actually several that are just really popping in front of our eyes. So jumping, I don't know how you, you did like the fun guy. And, and there's, and there's reasons to, I mean, my colleague, Ronald Bailey wrote a, um, a feature a few months ago called the last pandemic, which is not a prophecy. Cause it's what he, it's, it, it's what he hopes, but he also gives his reasons for thinking this might be the case that the, um, for the same reasons they were able so quickly to come up with vaccines this time. And not only did they do it as quickly as one of those vaccines, they actually had synthesized within a week of right. the pandemic, you know, being known. It wasn't ready to go because they hadn't tested it and so on. Um, but I mean, like, that's awfully quick. And so he's he is like making the case and it's much more complicated than than I'm doing here. But, you know, that this sort of I mean, this is the positive side of the constant, you know, information uh, of, of, of the constant complexity intense, and intensification. It's not all the kind of anime that we're discussing here. People are coming up with new tools like that. You know, the uh, the Internet is like a source of great joy as well as great paranoia. I, there are so many do-it-yourself creative projects. I mean, you could take any one of these, um, any area of, of human endeavor that involves people you know, collaborating and communicating and see ways in which it has been, you know, improved by this very same technological and social and cultural change that is fueling these other things um, that we've just been complaining about for 30 or 40 minutes, however long we've been talking. So, you know, it's a, um, I mean, here, here's an, an example, which may or not, may not be useful, but there was a time when just having music notation was a great revolution in being able to make music. It, you weren't just teaching other people by imitation or you know by ear and so forth. You were you were able to like sort of quickly distribute to a large number of people sort of standardized. This is what I want you to do, um, and then sort of match it up with the technology of creating different sorts of instruments. Recording initially meant you just recorded a performance, but people soon discovered the studio was itself an instrument. And people were able to do things like overdub and then change the speed and, and uh, even like change, you know, do things backwards and so on for weird effects. <laughs> even setting aside like psychedelic strangeness and, 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 you know, Stockhausen and so on, people were able to make the producer and the engineer um, as much a part of the music and also reproduce musical instructions in this way rather than just through written notation. Then the, pro the process of doing that got democratized. You, it went from something doing the studio to then having producers and DJs remixing things, mixing things together, doing what nowadays we would call a mashup. Now, people all over the, uh, the world um, who just have technology um, available to anyone of kind of a middle-class Western income uh, can get their hands on, uh, or, 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 or less money actually than that, and do the kinds of things that were not just reserved for studio wizards 60 years ago, but were just inconceivable to people as a way to express yourself musically 100 years ago. That and the speed of this and the extent to which it's been sort of spread across and, and, and democratized, had, and it just feels like it's just speeding up more and more. That's just one art form. I, I mean, imagine that going on in every other art form, in every science. And in terms of just, you know, people's relationships, you know, how people interact with each other, a lot of us now think of internet communication as something that took the place of face-to-face -face, um, interaction over the last two years. But of course, before then, it was a mixture, you know, right. um, and whole new social forms of interaction were spontaneously emerging just by virtue of the fact that people were walking around with phones in their pockets. So I, to me, this is all, I mean... This is all parallel to Chapel Perilous, but it is not in itself perilous. It's exciting. It, it, it's something to um, be happy about, even as we're being deeply disturbed by all that other stuff that we were talking about. I am not sure that you can have one without the other. You, you don't have to have, you know, all this high level of violence and so forth, because we just had a period of several decades of relatively speaking, surprisingly low violence by American standards, right? Mm. And hopefully there's a way to get back to that. But, you know, there's always going to be conflict. There's always going to be fear. There's always going to be just misunderstandings that can fuel things. And I'm glad that while this um, intensification process is 
making easy for people to find themselves plunged into Chapel Perilous, maybe it'll help pull them out the other side too, because it's creating great tools and not just tools for ourselves to use by ourselves, but to use, you know, with each other and, you know, grab someone by the hand and pull them out the other side of the chapel. I, I, again, I have mixed my metaphors unforgivably. <laughs> no, so, I think yeah. that I, I like your music metaphor. You start talking about music notation and I kind of paralleled that to the printing press. Yeah. So a similar path or, or something, but the, the general idea is there. But what I really like is it, it seemed to always come down to democratization is maybe where we're at in this technological process. And the printing press, you know, helped. I mean, there are people who make very compelling arguments that the printing press helped spread, you know, conflicts that led to wars of religion and so on. I mean, this is not the first time that an incredibly useful communications technology has also spread really bad things. Mm. But we got to learn to work with that rather than try to hold. I mean, we can't hold. The only way to hold it back would be to interrupt it apocalyptically right you know like right. the super villain maneuver and we don't want to do that even if we could and i don't think you or i could but you know we can figure out how to look to the uh more beneficial side of, of what's happening and and both shape those tools and also of course you know and this is where it comes back to politics figure out the kind of institutions that make that kind of decentralized uh, collaboration possible and uh, that reward the more benevolent than malevolent kinds of, uh, of collaboration and, and work. Right, right. It'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. I have I've thought there's, there's kind of this jumping Jesus exponential growth of, of technology, but it also seems to me like one of Wilson's themes is kind of Toffler's third wave and this idea of agrarian or hunter-gatherer to agrarian to industrial to... Um, information age or digital age or whatever it is, technological age. Do you see that play out? It's kind yeah, of what the, we're talking about in a way here. The third wave was one of those books that like really impressed me when I read it as a teenager and now it seems like, but then started to seem like the big idea was getting in the way of all the textured weirdness of the world. You know, it's like, mm. I don't know, you can reduce everything to to a, a series of waves. And there's this new book I haven't read yet, although I've seen some excerpts, The Dawn of Everything, which sort of calls into question the sort of necessary progression from you know, hunter-gatherer to agriculture and so on. It talks about the different ways that people um, experimented with different social forms, you know, at, at the cusp of the, what someone like Toffler calls a, um, well, that doesn't say call an inevitable revolution. This discusses as though it's one. That said, when Toffler died, you know, I picked up, the third wave and power shift again and looked through them. And, and I, I realized how much of them I had kind of incorporated and forgotten that I had mm. gotten there and was still on some level expecting to see happen. And some of their, I, should, I say Toffler, we should say the Tofflers because Alvin and Heidi Toffler co-wrote even those earlier books that only had Alvin's name on the cover. Some of their um, forecasts were right on target. Some of them were way off target. I mean, they were expecting you know, uh, you, people who are younger and younger being able to um, assume assault res adult responsibilities mm. um, and sort of break out of that kind of, you know, the industrial schooling model. And, and instead, if anything, I feel like adolescence is extending into the 20, the people's 20s and, and things like that, which is, I mean, maybe in the long term, they'll be right. But, you know, some of their prophecies kind of belly flop, but that's the way it is with any sort of futuristic prophecy. It is true that a lot of what people wrote about information technology, well, I mean, at, it, when the internet was either just too new for people to even realize it was there or wasn't around yet, feels kind of, um, does feel, I, I've, I've read things from the late 60s, early 70s about in like old magazines now forgotten, like radical software, uh, stuff about people going out with, um, at the time, were incredibly decentralized video production technologies because you could wear it on your back, you know, and not put it in your pocket. <laughs> but it's a, um, it feels, sounds clunky now, but at the time it was, you know, it, a radical step forward. And a lot of the stuff people were saying then, you know, it, it foretold, you know, the age of YouTube and all that today. Maybe not exactly the way that it, they expected it to come true, but it was, um, and, and so, I mean, there was a time when people would look at, because people, the, a lot of those early video, guerrilla video folks saw cable as their big outlet. And a lot of them actually did kind of 
colonize, you know, public access channels and things like that. But, you know, if it, in like 1987, someone would say, look, the utopian dreams of cable didn't come true. Um, mm. this, this Instead, we've got, you know, HBO. And at that point, you didn't, this HBO didn't even mean like The Wire. It just meant like watching movies, not, you yeah. know, uh, really high quality TV shows. But nowadays, what do you know? It turned out it was prophetic after all. It's just that cable TV wasn't exactly the medium that people expected it to be. So, uh, and another one was, you know, Suddenly we have video phones again, like you and I are talking over what was considered to be, you know, the futuristic technology of tomorrow in 1970 and which, you know, 20 years ago, people said, oh, that's a dead end, you know, and there were reasons to think because like, that's not what people wanted for a phone call. Someone wanted to be able to talk, you know, just out of the shower, not worry about what they looked like. That's why we still have the ability to, to do that. But now we finally found a way that this is something people can do and people use it as a creative medium. It's not just video phone. People are putting on actual plays during yeah. the pandemic over what in 1970 would be called the video phone. And I don't think anybody was predicting, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think anyone was predicting that as being a use for the video phone. Maybe somebody who was one of those guerrilla TV pioneers was predicting something like that uh, could be done through multiple channels. I don't know, be more likely to show up there. But you don't know how these technologies are going to be deployed and you don't know which thing that looked like a dead end is suddenly going to pop up and turn out to be important after all. Mm, Yeah, I know as Wilson fans, we were kind of left with this idea that the inter- internet was just going to lead us all to to this maybe logic mindset and democratization of ideas. And, and I think we'll get there, but certainly uh, in the meantime, we've fallen into this chapel perilous of social media polarization. Uh, that just came up for me as we were thinking about this, but mm-hmm. well, it'll be interesting to see what the future holds. I think there's some, a lot of talk about web three these days and we'll see where that goes. Yeah. People will say it was overhyped and then parts of it will turn out to have been important after all. Ah. Probably. When I, I, look, I just issued a prophecy and I said I wasn't going to do that. I said <laughs> well, it that's a pretty not true. <laughs> I know. It's, it, it's the one time that won't be true. But, you know, it, it's kind of interesting also. You've probably seen people getting really sour about Operation Mindfuck now. People saying um, that we thought that kind of prank was was clever then but now look that's i mean like the more extreme ones they'll say like that's what got trump elected which is not exactly true but you know i look at some of the awful people who are using those kinds of techniques now and they're forgetting that a lot of COINTELPRO looks like operation mindfuck even while operation mindfuck was going on you know or uh some of the stuff that you know nixon's dirty tricksters were doing i did an an article for the 40th anniversary of the um chicago 1968 police riot but it, that was the news peg, but it was really a story about the Yippies who were obviously overlapped with the Discordians and had a lot in common with that sort of pranksterish spirit. And I thought, you know, who um, it would be interesting to interview is Roger Stone. Now, Roger Stone at this point was oh, not the um, figure of Trump era infamy. He had, he had been, he was not entirely obscure, but he was just kind of like on the edge of sort of like um, Republican politics. But of course he had been part of Nixon's reelection efforts and, and had, done some stunts that I, at any rate, I, I just thought it would be interesting to sort of get his, um, get his take because I wondered if there would be some like sort of professional admiration. Like I, I don't like the abuse politics, but I, I like their ability to um, get the media to pay attention to them through these kind of pranks. And sure enough, that's basically what he said. And then he also, also surprised me. He, um, He's a drug reformer, and he actually had like done some like stuff with some old EOPs in uh, New York, um, like on the same side which I did not expect uh, to hear from him. But disinformation and, and, and pranks and, and, and all this stuff has always been just sort of a, a tool available to people, not just to people you like and not just to people you don't like. And I, I kind of get annoyed by the folks who say, um, well, Operation Mindfuck you know, doesn't look the same now. I, they knew then, I mean, they were swimming in an intensely paranoid time. That's part of what they were reacting against, you know? Or, you know, or people say conspiracy theories aren't fun anymore and that all these crazy um, quasi-fascist uh, and outright fascist people are, are expressing them. What do you think those guys were talking about in the 1960s? I've read the far-right you know, newsletters from that era. They're 
filled with conspiracy theories. You know, it's a um, a lot of what people we can talk about how things intensify and so forth. But as with you know, reading the old Porta Pack video guys, the underlying ideas and 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 phenomena are not new. We've been through this before. It's with a different set of uh, technologies. It's it doesn't move as quickly as before. There's uh, all sorts of new things that can knock you for a loop, like COVID nineteen. But it's it's not terra incognita. People have been wandering through Capital Perilous a long time, and it's not the first time the United States, you know, found itself mired in it. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Huh? Yeah, and there's at least an element of that. Yeah, it's not like we ever came out completely into a world of hope and so on. Although I got, there was that great period of time. I call it a great period of time and people can then list all, all the awful things that happened in it. But between um, the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the War on Terror, I, I, uh, I once mm. called it the time between the fall of the walls and the fall of the, ter- the towers. And I thought I was so clever. And then someone told me that, oh, I think it was Ian Banks had already use that phrase so or something like it so i can't claim it but it's a um i mean now i can look back and see which things went wrong then that helped set the stage for what went wrong later because you know the war on terror is kind of i mean now i mean before the pandemic i would say the war on terror was the big derailing thing that was you know pushing us off all sorts of nice tracks but that's when i was most sort of hopeful i mean there was a sort of a cooling down period in the 80s, but you could have imagined the 80s going in a wrong direction too. And certainly you still had lots more of those sort of, I mean, one of the best things about the end of the Cold War is that, you know, there was not all these proxy wars all over the globe um, where, you know, people, I mean, it's great that, you know, the Soviet Union and the United States never came to a, a direct war with each other, obviously. But, you know, I, I think that the uh, people of you know Latin America and Asia and so forth are very um, happy to not be the stomping grounds for, um, you know, these uh, proxy conflicts. I think there was a hope then that was sort of a lot of it was lost, but a lot of what was happening in the 90s has continued. A lot, I mean, like good stuff that was happening then. It's been happening under the shadow of the war on terror and 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 other bad things. And to some extent, what's happened in the last 20 years shows how much was happening under the surface that we had not extinguished. You know, when things were more sort of optimistic and hopeful in the 1990s, but. You know, that period between 89 and 2001, I don't know that that was another room of Chapel Perilous. I mean, a lot of people found their own ways to get into Chapel Perilous then, but I really did feel like we were kind of reorganizing on a higher on a higher level, you know, not the highest possible level, but definitely higher than before. If you can just think about how much more uh, liberty and self-government there was all over the world and and how much less war and how much um, less intense the wars that did happen were. I mean, just to the point where terrorism could, I mean, obviously 9-11 was an especially bad case of terrorism, a, a terrorist attack that doesn't have many comparable things in American history. But so much of what we think of as the big terrorist attacks of the last decade after 9-11 are dwarfed by just, you know, things that happened from day to day during World War II. You know, it's just a... I can be a 90s nostalgist, but I don't want to get stuck in the nostalgia <laughs> because I feel like we can take what was good then and what we've continued to build on. And then maybe when we get through this chapel perilous, we can come up on yet an even higher level of self-organization or whatever that phrase was. And at least until the next chapel perilous comes along for the globe to roll into. Well, Jesse Walker, it's it's been a true pleasure. You have some books that have been out. Do you want to promote anything? Yeah, well, if we you could mention you? this one, because it's the one where I talk about the United States of Paranoia, because I talk about both Thornley and Krasner and their um, Chapel Perilous experiences in there. And obviously, I write about Wilson in there, too. Okay, United States of Paranoia. And do you have a place where we can track you down, Twitter handle? or I I um, tweet under the handle, not Jesse Walker. Um <laughs> And Perfect. I will never get a blue check because that, what would it even mean to confirm that I'm not Jesse Walker? <laughs> but that's that's me. And, and I write regularly for Reason Magazine, where I also edit the book review section and have a hand in all sorts of other stuff that happens there. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for your time. That concludes our episode. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. 
A big thank you to Jesse Walker for taking the time to talk with us. You can find Jesse on Twitter at NotJesseWalker and find his books and articles linked into the show notes. Thank you to Christina Pearson and Richard Ross of Flaritas Press, and thank you to our engineer, Ryan Reeves, for putting it all together. Our next episode, releasing on the 23rd of July, will feature metamagician Philip Farber. Until then, I am your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor e hilaritas. You fearlessly adopted some of the most bizarre positions on almost every topic, so... I have? Of, well... See, I thought all my positions were perfect common sense and the rest <laughs> of the world was weird. Uh,